first ones we've ever closed still buy from us every single month it's beautiful interesting it is chef's fucking kiss so it's like, so it like a blessing in disguise that you didn't really get the funding that you were looking for he's like no and i was like all right well susan you know right down the road it's like she's gonna pick it up she's thinking about picking it up like do you want her to be the first person on the block with this new product and john was like oh, i'll buy some <laughs> and like real entrepreneurs actually do yeah. the stuff yeah. not just study it that's yeah. fair and then i went home that summer i started a company with my cousins made like 20k in six weeks and i was like Welcome to episode number 30 of, of the New Money Talks pod. Perfect. Perfect. On the money. Today we have the, uh, call it the Matcha King or something. Matcha Mogul. Can we call Matcha it Matcha Mogul. Matcha Mogul. We got Steve O'Dell canceled on us a few times, but we finally made it happen. One, one time. <laughs> Our boy over few. here. Um, I don't want to butcher who Steve is. He's a very uh, accomplished, successful person. He's doing a whole bunch of amazing things right now. Um, Pretty much if someone met you, actually before any of this, give me a second. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Oh, yeah. We're probably at a thousand by now, so I'll just keep doing that. Yeah. Anyways, before we go into this, uh, I don't want to butcher this. So if you were at a bar, Steve, and a girl walked up to you, right? Yeah. How would you explain who the hell Steve O'Dell is? Give us like the, the two, three minutes of who Steve O'Dell is. Um, if a random girl walked up to me, I'd say I work at Costco <laughs> and totally avoid the work conversation. Nice. Um, nice. But yeah, no, I'm the founder and CEO of a matcha brand called Tenzo, six years old, um, been around a while, seen everything, grown the company a ton, um, it's been a sick run. And then um, more recently, I've been branching out the empire a little bit. Uh-oh. That's what we're talking about today, right? Yeah. Well, what, what, whatever you guys want. Let's let. Let's, let's go, th go into that. What are you branching out into right now? I'm curious. I'm curious, Mr. Steve. Um, right now, it's this conversation we were having kind of just before we started. Um, businesses have a lot of cost centers. So you think about anything on the P&L that you're spending a lot of money on. Could be fulfillment in your case, starting a 3PL. It could be agencies. Um, saving the Kyle is buying all his ads. Boom. Got an ads agency. So we were doing this thing on TikTok where we were paying creators on a tiered model. Um, it's like how well the video does, the creator gets more money. If it's crappy, they get less. And um, we were hitting like a $1 to $3 CPM, sometimes sub $1 CPM. Nice. And for a brand like Tenzo, we, we already have like pretty solid distribution, a great D2C business, good Amazon business. All those eyeballs are really efficient top funnel strategy. And I was like, oh, why don't we just make this a company? Um, yeah. So yeah, I just launched that last month and um, it's going really well. Before you said cost center into profit center, we said about Amazon's a really big company that did this, right? Yeah, exactly. So like pretty much they spent a lot of money on servers. We were talking about this before. Yeah. And like they started AWS, which is like billions and billions of billions. It's like a hundred billion dollar, hundred billion. With a B. Line of business. Yeah. Um, so, so, so run us through this. So you have this, you have this strategy at Tenza that worked really, really well. Yeah. Now you're pretty much opening it up to like other D2C brands. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, D to C to start. I feel like I'm just the same thing we just talked about using my network. Um, yeah. First few clients and um, we're going to try and double the agency for as long as many months in a row. So my question to you, because I mean, I get this all the time. They're like, oh, you've built successful brands. You even have a brand that's doing well right now. Why branch off into the servicing space? That's the first hard question we got from you today. Oh, you're a real <laughs> curveball. <laughs> um, no, the real answer is... I think it's challenging and Tenzo is, it's not like, I don't want to sound cocky or anything or like a dick, but it's at this point where like it's, it's, it's got systems and it's running and self sustaining. Yeah. Like, and growing. And like we were just, we got really lucky in a weird way. Like when we tried to raise money, like in the peak of the bull market, like everyone's out here raising FU money. Yeah. And we went out to raise money and all the traditional food and beverage investors were like, now nah, your business is a little bit weird. What, what was weird about it? We chose alternate channels, um, which now in in hindsight we look really smart. But at the yeah. time, everyone's like, "Nah, you're not in traditional retail." It's um, so like grocery and food and beverage is like super common, biggest channel, most amount of consumer spending for food and bev is in traditional grocery stores. And but the, at the same time, it's extremely expensive. 
to pay to play to be in those channels. Do you think Facebook is expensive? Like try doing a quarter million dollar free fill into every target nationwide. Mm. Yeah. It's just it's a mess. Yeah. So if you don't raise a ton of money, that's that strategy is less likely to work. So we went a different route and we went into food service and started selling to cafes. You know, the the to use an e com term, the L T V on a cafe is, you know, extremely high yeah. and it's not like a, an e-com subscriber like a good d2c brand will have maybe 30 percent of subs active in 12 months maybe i'd be like top tier oh, interesting. Yeah. and cafes will you know last for five years we have a lot of cafes that are like the first ones we've ever closed still buy from yeah. us every single month it's beautiful interesting it is Chef's fucking kiss. So it's like, so it like a blessing in disguise that you didn't really get the funding that you were looking for because it yeah, like forced you to exactly. Take and the companies that did get that money, like one, it's really risky. So there's just like the inherent risk of raising VC money in any company across all industries. But also the cap tables are all being reset right now. So the market changes, interest rates go up. You know, you might as well put money in a treasury bill. And the valuations are down substantially. So it's like the founders, they're either, it's like they're getting diluted so much. That, yeah, maybe it's not really worth it to spend as much time in this business. So, you know, not to mention like we still own like almost the whole company, um, which is just an incredibly valuable asset. And even if it grows slightly less, it's like I'm in it for the long haul. Like I want to grow it for 50 years. I don't care. Like, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's funny that you were saying that you kind of turned your systems into something that worked for your business. And then you were like, well, let me just do this for other businesses to like mitigate the costs of doing it for my own businesses or just to make more money. That's kind of what both of us did. Exactly. Like he started in fulfillment, fulfilling his own brands and was like, I don't want to fucking pay this rent. Let me take on a brand who can pay this rent so that my fulfillment is kind of like free or at least my storage. And I was like, well, I have brands and I have all these costs and variable expenses and I'm really good at the marketing. So why don't I just put these systems into other brands? so that they can give me capital to deploy more into my brands. You know, that was at least the idea of it. But then the servicing side kind of consumes you a little bit because you're like, oh, this is nice. Like you just need clients. You just, you offer a good service and the money keeps coming in. It's consistent. It's like as, as the, it's like an entrepreneurial nine to five. Yeah, you know, as opposed to like the are, volatility. Are you scared at all that like you're going to start spending less time on Tenzo and more on this and like Tenzo might like lose a little bit because of that? But it's self-sustaining. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not self-sustaining. I think that's... It's like it still requires a lot of work. But um, as for the time thing, no, like I've, we've said this a bunch of times. I feel like I'm in like some of the peak earning years of my life or at least like, you know, hopefully not peak. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, knock yeah. on fucking wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Definitely yeah. not. But like I just feel like I'm at a point where I don't have any kids. I don't I'm not like doing anything crazy that I'm responsible for. I'm not mm -hmm. worried about like four kids and paying college debt. Yeah, like, yeah. I can yeah. just be. I have money and I have, you know, six, Time. seven years of experience. And it's just like, I just need to push the needle right now. And like all these decisions. Now it's time to hit the gas. Yeah. It's like, it's gas time. Qu question. I want to like go into Tenzo a little bit because like, I think Tenzo is a very interesting brand where like, uh, pretty much your customers now, it's not, it's not just like Facebook. Like when you start, when you launch a brand in the first year, it's like, oh, you're trying to acquire all these customers. You literally have like real people who like actually enjoy the product. It's part of their lives. Like yeah, I mean, thing, right? Like, that's, that's normal, right? At, at Tenzo, like, it's people totally. who bought this thing for like five years. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, even uh, when I was in Seattle at this trade show last week, I had probably 20 people come up to me and they're like, oh my God, I subscribe to you. <laughs> and I was like, no way, like, sick. So then my, my, my question is because I think a lot of D2C is just like arbitrage on Facebook, Instagram, stuff like that. It's hard to get over like the chasm in a sense to get to where you're at with like Tenzo. What do you think gets an e-commerce brand to that point? Because I feel like everyone's just like fighting with Facebook. Like here, take a hundred bucks and give me like a hundred dollars back. And like one day I'll get paid like type of thing. While you're in this place where like you did it for a long time and like people actually give a shit and like actually want to buy the product and care and like it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a couple of things. Like, I mean, first of all, fuck, I still feel like I'm just like constantly fighting Facebook. Like, yeah. But you're not though, because like, if, if, like... But it's if it, you go to trade shows like and people know the brand and actually buy yeah, it, and yeah. like it. There's like a sense of um, like omni-channel, and there's like it's a it's difficult to say like how correlated everything is. But like people who buy Tenzo in a cafe every day, eventually they're like, oh, like maybe I can just get this at home. They go to the cafe and they say, what, what mantra is that? 
the barista is like Tenzo. And then they're like, oh. And then they go look, look it up, up on Tenzo. Amazon and they buy it on D2C. And there's like that, you know, trade And that off. costs you nothing to acquire. Yeah, it's free. Yeah. Um, you made money off of it because you sold it to the cafe. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, that's something that we're trying to get better at. And I think, like, we don't really have a super great marketing engine for the company yet. We don't even, like, we don't even really do that well. At it, I would say, like, there's so much potential. But one of the things that makes Tenzo strong is just we're fucking frugal like so many yeah. companies i remember when we first met you were like yeah we don't spend money on anything no don't spend money it's control it's costs stupid, right? all it's points it's like it's underrated how big of a hack that is and it's also just like if you listen i don't know if you guys listen to a lot of podcasts yeah we do but I there's do. this there's this one called founders david cerna i think's his name okay mm -hmm. really good listen to any podcast on like the great entrepreneurs of like the early 20th century like Rockefeller, Carnegie, first thing those guys say is keep an eye on your costs. Watch every fucking dollar. And like, those are some of the best cash flowing businesses in history, right? Yeah. It's like, don't spend money. More in the bank, more in the growth. You know, it's like, dude, this asset just gets way better. How, how did you, well, was it you or your partner that started thinking about the, uh, let's sell to like, not just online, let's sell to like cafes and all this stuff? No, I mean, that happened really early actually. I think it was like a light bulb. Um, and you guys started walking into fucking cafes and you're like, hey, you want to buy a matcha? Yeah, like we would go <laughs> every morning to this one cafe and work from it. And we were like, mm. why don't we sell matcha in this cafe? <laughs> <laughs> and we went to the cafe owner and they were like, why would we buy matcha? Like, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't in any cafes yet. It wasn't, it wasn't at Starbucks? No, it wasn't at Starbucks or Dunkin'. This was like wow. six years ago. It was basically unknown. And um, then I was like, all right, let's go to the guy down the road. There's a cafe like two blocks away. And I was like, John, do you want to buy some matcha? He's like, no. And I was like, all right, well, Susan, you know, right down the road, it's like she's going to pick it up. She's thinking about picking it up. Like, do you want her to be the first person on the block with this new product? And John was like, oh, I'll buy some. <laughs> and then so I went to Susan and I was like, Susan, John just bought. Like, do you want to you want to get in on this? And she's like, yeah, all right, I'm in. And then, like, that was a really good lesson for us about just, like, constantly leveraging the size of the business. And then you get bigger ones and bigger ones and bigger ones. And you get cost of goods reductions. And you can go compete at, like, really large cafes. Interesting. So, reminds me like, WeWork. Like, that WeWork grew the company. They were like, oh, yeah, I got this investor who's, like, getting ready to put up this money. But, like, I'd be happy to let you in on it and just, like, kick them to the curb if you want to come. This is an just like amazing project. Until you make it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little yeah. bit. You yeah, need yeah. a little bit of mojo in the beginning. Yeah. Do you see any other like type of uh, D to C brands that are doing stuff like that? Because like that's just like smart. Like because like I think people get stuck in this whole D to C Shopify world where you can just sit behind a computer and just go like numbers, this on and numbers on the screen. But it's like yeah, you're really running a business. Like you can go sell it to anybody. Yeah, you know what yeah. I, mean? I think there are a lot of really good brands that are um, creating companies that sell in unique channels. A lot of them. Um, for example, like. At this trade show, I was sitting in the hotel lobby, and this woman comes up, and she's like, "Oh, yeah, how's it going?" I was like, "Some basic pleasantries," and um, she's like, "Oh, I'm taking like 70 people to like Carbone tonight, or like some some it wasn't Carbone, it was like a uh -huh. very fancy steakhouse, like Morin's or something." And I was like, "Oh, like, how much does that dinner cost?" And she was like, "I think it's like 60, 70 k." 60, 70. Yeah, like, it was it was off the wall. Shit. And I was like, no way. I'm like, this is like a syrup company. They have like, when you go into a cafe and it's like a vanilla latte, mm. they make like the single little syrup that you just like two pumps in. Jeez. It's like a vanilla syrup. And I, that dinner amount that I was like, wait a minute, like how much are you doing in revenue? And she's like, oh, this year I think we'll do like four or 500 million. Jeez. And like, you haven't even heard of this brand. No one yeah. knows it. It's just. The syrup, the pumps. It's just in a hundred thousand cafes. It's kind of like those like boring businesses in a sense, where like like there's people that have like laundromat empires that do half you know, yeah. half a billion a year, and you're just like what? exactly. I, I've been like half joking, not joking, but I want to buy like a garbage company. I swear to God, I think that's a great business. <laughs> it's a great business. Like, and they think, sell them, and they doesn't Bill Gates own like all the garbage companies in the U.S. or something? Oh, I didn't know that. No. I think Does he's he really. I think, I think he's <laughs> no a, chance. Nah, big he's daddy excited. bill, dude. Not the, not the ones in Jersey though. The ones in Jersey are a little, you know, sketch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's fun. no. But born businesses are good. Like there's like one yeah. lady, like Cody Sanchez. Shout out Cody Sanchez. If you're watching this, we're getting you on eventually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she talks about all that shit where it's like yeah. just cash flowing, real good businesses like like vending machines and all. That. all yeah, that yeah. ATMs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people try to overcomplicate shit. 
Yeah. And like money is simple. So simple. You guys um, follow my first million? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Sam just tweeted today like some guy that sells like furniture to like offices or something or hospitals, like some obscure thing. He's like got like ten million dollars, like two employees. Like it's just like nah, it's just chill as hell. Yeah, like you just gotta find like these industries and just like focus and be ne- like niche and like don't like a lot of people try to be cool. Yeah, and like what you really want is to like be cool, but for like a weird reason. Go it just on. makes no something, that. Make, what, make what, something what, that works essentially. Like no one cares if you have like the hottest beverage or like you sell mushroom powder. Like I, I don't give a. F- Consumers don't <laughs> yeah. care. Like yeah, the results yeah. are cool. Yeah, it doesn't like, really matter how you get there. Like. Yeah, exactly. But I think a lot of, at least in food and beverage, I feel like a lot of people try to be trendy when they actually should just try to run good companies. Yeah. How do you, uh, as a young, you, you're still young, relatively. Even yeah, like, dude. Whatever. This guy's calling me old. I'm 28. <laughs> no, no, relatively dude. young. Like, like I think a big thing that we deal with people watch, watching this, everyone has like the fucking uh, shiny object problem. Everyone has like ADD yeah. or whatever ADHD. They want to do six. How do you stick to something for six years? Like, actually, though. Like, how do you, like, every even single eight, day work like on the same months. thing for six years? How long did it mean? take before you, like, it like, took off? I think I got uh, my first $500 from the company. I don't know, maybe, like, six months in, dude. I was broke. I didn't graduate yeah. college. I dropped out, moved on my buddy's couch. Like, I, I had no so, fucking See, money. now people are like, if I don't make $500 in the first hour doing it, I'm going to quit it and do something else, you know? Yeah, I think those people are just idiots. Yeah. Good companies take a long time to build. But yeah. you never wanted to quit all these years? Um, not really. I would. I actually probably really never have thought about like actually quitting. Were there Sometimes we're super where, fucked up, though. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say, were there any instances where like you know, you know, hundred thousand dollars worth of inventory just came in and it was fucked, and you're like, damn, this sucks. Like any just big problems. Yeah, the biggest problem, <laughs> which we're basically finally fully recovered from, is we are supplying one of the largest food. And beverage companies in the world like fortune 500 with matcha for like four years we had this great relationship and we are cash flowing you know well beyond seven figures a year wow. it's one deal it was, it was like some fucking magic yeah um i can't even say like how good it was and i don't want to say the, the company yeah keep it to um, yourself yeah. i'll tell you guys after yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. um Essentially, like there was no contract with them, and we had asked them, like, we need it, we, we got to do a contract. And the crappy part is, we have to buy all of the matcha during oh, harvest each year. So, like, you only buy once, and you're basically you're stuck with that for twelve months. Yeah. So, if you're if you're wrong, like, you're kind of you're Damn. you're on the hook. So, like, right after the matcha buying season last year, they cut it off and changed the formulation. And we had like a million five, maybe two in just pure inventory. Damn. Just powder. Just pure powder. Just green powders. Um, what do you do? We sold it to a Japanese conglomerate, some of it. And then um, just at, like at cost. Yeah, yeah. We closed a couple of deals. We took on like an emergency loan. Like we've had to put all our cash into that. It's just... Yeah. Hey, you figure out a way to unload it. Yeah. Damn. You got to unload it. That's it. So what's the lesson you learned from that one? Contracts, man. <laughs> I knew that was the answer. That was the answer. Don't overbuy inventory without the contracts in place. Like, Yeah. There was one uh, Greta with, I think, Skinny Me Tea or something. She said she, one time she ordered a million dollars worth of tea. It came in spoiled from a supplier. A million dollars worth of, like, tea. It's gone. It's Crazy. Poof. At least she had good payment terms on that. So <laughs> she didn't pay until she uh, already saw it. Oh, man. But yeah, like really uh, sophisticated food and beverage companies have like all these testing processes. Like you always get samples before it's like cold quality control systems to yeah. avoid that. But question on building the business too. So, like at what point do you start hiring people too? Because I think it, people in DC hire too fast. I don't think you hired fast at all. You hired nice and slow. Yeah, real slow. I mean, we also, another mistake we made was hiring too fast. So we definitely did that. Oh, you did? You hired a lot of people fast? Yeah, not, I would say like year three, we had like 10 people. We were just like Shit. burning so much money. <laughs> How you paying all these people? <laughs> yeah, well, we raised a little bit of money. It was just like, just dumb. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, but then we stopped that and now we're, we are still only have five people. Just wow. super lean. It's the way to go. So we're, all of our manufacturing's outsourced. Like, yeah. we get finished goods, a couple agencies here and there. 
Can, can you talk about how, overseas. How, how big the company is? You want to talk about that? No, I don't want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, it's small. What's up, New Money Talks fam? Quick one for our sponsors over at Ad Copy AI. Tony Mastalone and his team have produced one of the most revolutionary marketing tools to date called Ad Copy AI. And what it does is essentially harnesses the power of AI in order to lead your uh, acquisition systems and strategies for your marketing efforts, right? So whether you're selling physical products or digital products, it is much more tailored and targeted for marketers relative to something like a chat GPT. And I wanna really quickly show you how it works. So let's say my buddy's company, Javi Coffee, he wants me to run ads for his brands and, and populate uh, ad copy. What I would do is I would come over to the ad copy AI Chrome extension. I'd click create Facebook copy and I'd provide some inputs, right? So this is the input category. So this is gonna be javicoffee.com. Target audience are going to be young Starbucks addicts. <laughs> and then, you know, it, you can also have selling points populate directly from the product URL. And they have something called a creativity amplifier, which is really unique. So the more creative you make it, the more kind of create, you know, obviously creativity they can pull into the copy. Um, it might not be incredibly accurate for what it is that you're going to be selling. And so you have to kind of play around with the creativity amplifier, right? So if you make this very low, it's going to be a very cookie cutter response depending on your inputs, right? So it might be like regurgitated, but when you have the creativity amplifier up, it gets very, very creative and it can spit out some really cool outputs, right? So I'm going to go ahead and click on generate Facebook ad copy, and we're going to let copy AI, ad copy AI do its magic. Boom, so we have elevate your coffee experience, tired of the same old Starbucks routine, meet Javi Coffee, your new coffee obsession. Crafted for true coffee lovers, our premium microdose coffee concentrate packs a punch of flavor and energy in every drop. This is so good. This is something way better than what I could do. Honestly, what any other human could likely do. And it generated that in seconds and pretty soon they're gonna have an update that directly imports this into your Facebook ads manager. So you don't even have to leave the platform, right? So. Shout out to Tony and the team over at Ad Copy AI. Definitely check out the link in our description if you're interested in getting this for you, for your brand, or for your agency. And make sure that you tell Tony or you tell the Ad Copy team that New Money Talks sent you so you can get that New Money Talks discount. Now back to the podcast. Oh, it's, small. it's a baby company. It's a baby. Baby. Compared to what it can be. Yeah. Ex oh, 100%. I don't know. I think it's going to stay small forever. Makes sense. <laughs> but what are you going to do? Talk about the strategy. Though. I'm curious. It's like a uh, agency strategy you got going on. Like, can you talk about that though? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems very unique, and like a lot of people don't talk about it. And, like, I want people to get some value out of this one that they can try at home, and then call you after that. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, call uh, call me, hit me up. Um, <laughs> what part of the agency? Like, what Tenzo's doing, or what I'm working on? Yeah. So, or? like, first of all, how'd you figure this out with Tenzo? And then, like, honestly, dude, like the strategy from the jump, like. We didn't know anything. I'm sure you guys did very similar things. It's you fucking learn. Yeah. And like you put your nose to the grindstone and you just get better. And like that's one of the reasons we've been able to stay so lean. It's like we have a really good cash flow model and financial systems and like we built them all ourselves. They work perfectly. We never need like a CFO so or you like use any models and all this. You made Excel models and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. I feel like I'm an expert really? in cash flow. You go to college? He went yeah. to UCLA. What did you he played volleyball too. Yeah, D D one athlete. Yeah. yeah, him too. Track and field. I was gonna do soccer or track, but what'd you study? I didn't really study. <laughs> what'd you major in? Vo volleyball. It's like, dude, I would never went to class. I I got a D in class once because I only went to the midterm and the final. And the professor after I turned the final was like, "This is a participation grade, just so you know." <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> Um, but no, I was just really involved in a lot of things. Like I wrote for the newspaper. I was in all the clubs. I wasn't in a frat, but I was friends with all the frat guys and the sorority yeah. girls and like the computer science club and did all the entrepreneurship stuff. And it's just like just learning a lot and meeting a ton of different people. And you're, you're not from California either, right? No, I'm from way upstate New York. And then was like it a shock when you went to UCLA? It's hilarious. Yeah, I, I I was wearing like my freshman year, like mid top Air Force Ones and like basketball <laughs> shorts, like Jordan shorts, like down to my fucking ankles. All the California kids are like, dude, what the, fuck? what the fuck are you wearing, bro? Where's your rainbows? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got a pair of rainbows yeah. eventually. That's so funny. I got the same shock. So, so you didn't like learn anything from college. You just kind of like went through, you had fun, and then you're like, 
this yeah. business, I'm figuring out everything myself. Well, no, nah, the only thing I learned from college was I took an entrepreneurship class. Me too. And that class, I got an A in. I went to every class. I was like, oh my God, like, yeah, like, what am I doing? Like, this is cool. Every, every other class sucks. This is like, like my professor actually sounds like he knows what he's talking about to an extent. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and then I did a couple months of like doing the, all the entrepreneurship clubs. Then I realized like everyone that's studying entrepreneurship is a, is a no offense if you're studying entrepreneurship, but a loser. And like <laughs> real entrepreneurs actually do yeah. the stuff, yeah. not just study it. That's yeah. fair. And then I went home that summer. I started a company with my cousins, made like 20K in six weeks. And I was like, what am I doing in school? Yeah. Then you dropped out. Yeah, I went back to school for like a couple more months, worked on some other things, some friends, and I was just done. One of my friends was fucking printing on Shopify. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're like, oh, this kid can do it. Like, I can work harder than him. Like, I, yeah. can, I can do that. Drop yeah. shipping portable chargers from China. See, he's a drop shipper too. Look at that. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm never drop shipped. Never once. Never once. Not even, not even a single sale. Oh, you didn't get a sale? No, I've never done it. I've never even tried to do it. Really? I've Why? thought of that. I've gotten dangerously close. Why, why, why not? I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know if the time and the effort thing is there. Like The time, it takes like a half an hour to make a store. Yeah, but I don't know. Like, maybe. I just think there's something to be said about like assets and like. Oh, of course. Another good thing is like, I think this might sound kind of lame and dorky, but I think like life the best people, and not saying I'm the best person. I'm definitely not Elon Musk, but I'm definitely not Joe Schmo. Yeah. Like, I just think you want to pursue good quests. It's like a gamer analogy, I guess, a little, in a sense. But like, a lot of people just go through life like just doing bad quests, set themselves up on bad trajectories. And it's like, or it's just like a little scam. You're like, and you can make a fucking phone game, you can make yeah. a dropshipping store, you can do whatever you want. But like, is that really like, are you going to look back in 40 years outside of the money you made from it and be like, that was, that was solid. Like that like, contributed to the world. Yeah. Like I feel good about that. And like, yeah. I feel that a lot with Tenzo and like, I think we've done like 300 million servings at this point. Like it's yeah. uh, maybe, maybe closer to 400 now, or maybe more, but it's like, it's like that is substantially, you know, impacting people, whether you've had it a thousand times or you've had it five, it's like, you know, there's real tangible benefits that you're getting every single yeah. time you drink it. It's not just like a, yeah. I made $20. Yeah. At, at what age did you figure that out though? Because in the beginning, you were like, I want to make money. In the beginning, you are like, I want to make fucking money. Well, I've never done a company that was like, uh, I want to make money from every company. But I think that's fundamentally, I believe it, it's just giving someone something of value. And you get the money in return. Yeah, like, you, I give you something of value. You give me money for it. I've worked hard to produce it. And so, you know, I think that's all it is. But like, I feel like everything I've worked on has always been, I legitimately felt like I was actually providing true value to someone else. Yeah. That's powerful. Look, at Steve got like, Steve, I can't, say, I can't say the same myself. <laughs> Some businesses I've gone in and just been like, man, like I'm broke. Like I need to help my family out. I, j I just want to make as much money as possible. Like as eth granted, as ethically as possible. Yeah, well, that's but, what like, but like the difference between, you know, two weeks shipping and like three days, I was like, I don't care. Like if they get it and I have great customer service and I've, and I've never done anyone wrong, then like, you know, I'm, I'll improve it over time and I'll get it there. Totally. Because I think a lot of people procrastinate because they, they kind of want to do that, but they they want to set everything up perfect and it takes nine months to do that. And then by the time they launch it, they have no proof of concept in the product. They It's, a, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of procrastination to like do something amazing because they want it to be perfect instead of just like starting, like maybe getting scrappy and like being knowing that that's not the end goal, but that might be a stepping stone you need to take to get there you know? yeah yeah agree and I, i'm all for stepping stones. So yeah so. Did, did, did you spend like 30k when you launched tenzo t like the website you spent 30k on it no dude i had <laughs> that's, no that's, that's what i'm I, saying I, I, no money no i it literally it, i wish my co-founder was here Rob. he would <laughs> he'd love this it was a weekend project we did the whole thing start to finish on like in a saturday and a sunday it was like shut said that make wow. a shopify store that's all you did shopify store went on google Typed in where to buy a wholesale mantra. Sure got like 50 units from this guy in Arizona. <laughs> and all we did was wow. send my co founder designed a label. Guy printed it, sent them to us. We were shipping on Tuesday. How'd you get sales? Our grandmothers. 
Yeah, too many people overcomplicate this shit. Dude, it was mad funny though. I remember I was so fucking cocky. I feel like young kids are just like they have this like naivete where like they are they think that like adults or like people that are in business operating like know nothing. Like even these two guys I'm at this agency right now, they're like college kids, they're like, we could easily make one, two million dollars a year in salary from like big tech, like right out of school. So like this agency needs to blow up. And I'm like Dude, you guys are so far off. Yeah. It takes a lot for someone to pay you a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, I just, so when Tenzo launched, I was just like, oh, we're going to do like 100K, like first day. Easy. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. He like, did like 100 cents. I'm a, I'm, I'm a boss. <laughs> yeah. We did like maybe like 400 bucks. Like, oh, with yeah. your grandma. Oh, fuck. Oh, like, wow, this is going to be a lot harder than we thought. Yeah. Did you, you raise money off Rip or no? Took a mm-hmm. while. No, no one would give us money, dude. And like going grandma's. back to what I said earlier, we were doing all this ourselves. So like, dude, the website sucked. The logos yeah. of my co-founder design are like so fucking ugly. Like it's Canva. like, I don't even think Canva existed. I think he used <laughs> I'm Adobe. I'm confused how the fuck you got to this point then. <laughs> <laughs> well, like what was the lever that got like, you from like, you know, let's say the first year got you from like barely getting by to like something popped off, something clicked. Well, we, we started to learn Facebook. You know, that was like one. And then like two was we figured out the wholesale thing. And three, we unlocked like massive cash flows in our bulk business. And we refunneled those cash flows into fucking Facebook. Like kept our costs relatively low the whole time. And you just like this whole thing just builds. Just builds day by day. Brick by yeah, brick. Every, every day. It's so just like one thing. Yeah, I would say a lot of small things and some medium things. Well, I feel like the same thing's gonna happen with the like if you do the agency for six years, we'll be talk having the same conversation. Like, well, the agency, I think we can. Uh, that's but, but, gonna happen. I think a lot quicker. Yeah, there's no fucking way that thing is gonna moon. Moon. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> what like because now you have the experience of it's, it's like you know when, when if you hire a contractor and they're, they're charging you a thousand bucks an hour and you're like. Nailing this, you know, a TV in the wall, and it took them 30 minutes. You're like, why are you charging me $500 for that? And it's like, well, because it took me seven years to learn the skill sets to be able to do it. So you're paying me for the seven years, not for the 30 minutes that it took. Exactly. Like in your case, it's like you built up the skill set over the seven years so that you can now scale the agency probably in seven months to like some certain height. I actually have a question for you. Back to the agency, it's newer companies, right? So it's like if you're launching a company right now, like an e-commerce brand, D to C. What's your mindset like? Like, how do you actually think to like get this to actually work? I feel like a lot of people think nice website, like nice logo, branding, bullshit, blah blah blah. Like, if you've done this for six years now, what would you do in, in this situation? You start with like I don't know, you have like five k in your bank account, and like I want to start like a, a new company, D to C. What do you do? I would try to compete in a. Um, underserved space with really good unit economics. What's an you guys all know this. Like, if you want Facebook to work, bro, you need you need margin. You need, Contribu- a- you need contribution dollars. Yeah, high OV or subscription, and like, you, you it just will never work. Like, so yeah, I don't know. Like, maybe some of this camera equipment would be good. There's, there's like a thousand dollar light. Interesting. You know what you got? Like, kind of what you're saying in terms of an underserved market. You can look at it as like, let me sell a product in an underserved market, or let me sell, uh, a, let me make a variation of a product that already exists that has like added value to it in a very big competitive market. So, like, you know, let's say there's like a water pitcher and you have this revolutionary filter on it that you went to a manufacturer to coordinate. It's like, well, every, like the water pitcher industry is huge, but because you've customized the product in a way that serves this market like in a way where someone who already has a Brita picture uh, picture would be like i would also buy your product because it's unique enough and it has some added value even though it's a massive market that's very competitive so like Thank either like making a variation of a product that's unique enough to where you can go after a competitive market or selling a generic product but to an underserved market yeah, yeah. our filter you never need to clean that's what i would do if i wanted to compete with Brita. just make like a self-cleaning filter there you go yeah. Brita sucks because you gotta fucking change the filter. <laughs> you can barely store any water in it. Have you heard of that new brand, Jolie? Uh, yeah, the showerhead. Yeah, the showerhead. I set one up for uh, my girlfriend that a couple weeks ripping, ago. Ripping, right? That that company's ripping. That's what I'm saying, dude. It's like yeah, yeah. that's a perfect example. Uh huh. 
High margin and subscription. And subscription. Oh my oh. god, <laughs> dude, the guy can spend a thousand dollars acquire a customer. Yeah, and it's like, and that, that's not like a super unique product. It's a variation of something like that. It's actually really smart as shit because everyone's fucking like uh, shower heads are disgusting. Like uh, over time, they just get nasty. So it's like, put this. Oh thing yeah, on. when I set it up, I was like, damn, this thing's probably forty years old. Like no one's ever <laughs> changing it. That's crazy. And then they have the subscription on, on the back. It's kind of like Manscaped. Manscaped was very good at that. Like the device was like a hundred bucks, hundred fifty bucks, whatever the hell it is, it cost him nothing. Like honestly, when we had Newman, like the beard company or whatever, we were going in. We we're gonna start doing ball trimmers and stuff like that because we saw Manscaped going up, like Meridian. That trimmer cost like five bucks, like four or five dollars. Like yeah. no bullshit. And they they give the whole story. If Manscaped sees this, they might tell me I'm stupid, but I'm not. I'm not stupid because I've saw, I saw the legit exact trimmer in China. Like my manufacturer had the same one. Everyone's got the same. No, because because they're like, oh, we spent all this time on R and D, blah blah blah. It's like, no, you did. Like you literally told your manufacturer in China, hey, like change the color and add like another button, and like make, you know what I mean? So that's R and D, baby. That's not R and D. Like if you listen to some of those podcasts, they're just like, yeah, we spent like six months in house R and D. Like this is magnetic. Come on, like yeah, you're selling a ball trimmer. Which is like just it's actually called. That's the, what they're doing, probably just shaving their balls all the time. <laughs> it's, it's actually called a baby trimmer. So yeah. it's like like you, you can shave it like a baby's head type of thing, like little hairs. That same like device can shave your balls because like you don't want to cut the baby's yeah, it's head. Like safe enough. So it's like safe enough to shave your balls. Like same yeah. same technology. They should do that in an ad. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a baby be like smooth enough to shave his baby's head. <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> had, actually, some of this AOV shit. How'd you guys do this with, with Tenzo? Testing. I mean, that was a huge unlock for the D 2 C side. You, you guys put the, the frother. <laughs> yeah. Well, you gotta have that. We mm-hmm. used to sell like thirty grams for like twenty five bucks, which is so low AOV. And then like we changed that to sixty, and we we're like, oh shit! Now we can spend a little more, acquire a customer. Yeah. And then we were like, oh, like we started subscription. And like, dude, if I could go back in time, oh my god, we should have done subscription like right from the jump. Um, huge fuck we missed the facebook golden era dude yeah like what like 2016 fuck. 2015 27 i mean 17 17 like we should have just immediately done that yeah oh, just everything uh, anyway but yeah we did that and then like we we used to put in this bamboo list the bamboo list is actually really expensive even the cheapest providers in china it's like five bucks oh damn i was like getting it here it's like landed like eight dollar cost jeez it's fucking terrible but the electric mixer bro the electric mixer is good shit good shit so you think the brand did very well, majority because of timing? No, because you know why it did well? Because Steve was just an animal. That's well, that, that's another thing but too. Like, but no, but timing, timing, was timing very is key. Important. Um, it's the same thing you said on this episode. You had this woman on. I think her name was Gina. Yeah. Oh yeah, she's a homie. Yeah, she's she she's sounds cool. cool. So <laughs> her thing, she was saying timing is key too. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true for Tenzo. Like matcha became a. It is a wave. It's like I mean, since we've started, Starbucks is nationwide. Dunkin's nationwide. That's true. It's in fucking Costco. It's everywhere. Um, so yeah, just riding that wave and like making sure that the business goals are following a macro trend. I also think I think that's a really critical lesson. And like you can only go as fast as the trend is actually happening. And like you can accelerate the trend if your company is good enough or there's enough companies in the category pushing it. Um, but if you get ahead of your skis, you know, something's going to be messed up. You're going to have to dial back. And That's real. What? Like the whole, like, you get ahead of yourself, like, the fuck does that? Well, you think about investors. it. If you raise too much money, like, you tell these investors, oh, yeah, we're going to triple every year for six years. But, like, in actuality, the, the whatever category you're in is only growing a certain amount. It's impossible. You're, just, it's, you're only as big as the market. Yeah. But, like, conversely, a company like Liquid Death, water is a very established market most commonly drink product in the world it's in everything they can just grow as fast as possible yeah the market's, just so goddamn market's there it's just fundamentally it's a differentiation and branding play which is what they did yeah it's crazy because there's like thousands of water brands but we all only really know like five that's true it's yeah. nuts that's, that's, I didn't think about yeah that. since i mean there's probably tens of thousands of different like water or at least attempt attempted water brands but like in every different grocery store there's like that one weird like you know value type one that's just like it's like the target brand ph like, yeah yeah 
It's like the pH it's like, like alkaline. alkaline. Yeah, alkaline levels. Yeah, yeah. Smart water. Yeah. Stop, not, not talking shit about the brand. It's like liquid IV actually solid brand. Like mentally though. Liquid like, liquid death. Yeah, I don't know. Um, clocks, uh, who knows, dude? I think it's time to tell. Time, yeah. Well, it's I, like, what's the value of just fucking water? It's just yeah. the, the market. It's just the branding. Yeah. It's all, it's a, it's yeah. I'm saying, like, what more value do you get? You don't get actually much. Literally, literally, water, dude, it's it's literally water, bro. Water. It's it's water. There's, there's nothing else to get. But it's like, what, you feel good because you're holding this thing? Like, no, I just eat. Here? Yeah, well, it can be your hi- more hydrated. I don't know. A starving man only wants one thing. Or a thirst, supply a thirsty and demand. Man. Sometimes it doesn't need to be a uh, special. You just, just, just got to find people that are thirsty. Mm-hmm. You said you also did some uh, angel investing and stuff like that? Yeah, a little, a little bit. I don't know. It's, it's all right. More fun than stocks. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> counting on it. Counting yeah, on yeah, it. So what yeah. No. Do it? yeah. Support, friends. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really have a lot of thoughts on it. I think it's super hard. Um, yeah, and like none of mine are close to maturing, dude. I'm, it's fucking. It's like <laughs> buying a lottery ticket with pretty high probability. What's relative that? to the? I said it's like buying a lottery ticket with like a relatively high probability compared to like yeah. the lottery. Yeah. Just shot in the dark. It's almost guaranteed to lose money. I think if I was like able to focus on it more and like build a better awareness i could do it better but i just don't i don't think like that's my path in life um now again if we're like 10 years down the road and like we all become really good friends and you guys are like oh like i'm starting a company i'd probably be like oh yeah like i'll invest in those guys like proven operators in yeah just good areas they know it's going to be successful yeah, yeah but I wouldn't even call that angel investing. I would just call it like I'm an equity partner in the business. And like, yeah, it's just like kind of partner, right? I don't feel a need to like invest in like 22 year olds trying to like make crazy products or things like that. Like, yeah. I want like seasoned operators that know what they're doing. It's like we don't need any category defining wins. Yeah, so I think like in California, like Bay Area, especially, you see a lot of that, like 22 year old like, right out of college. Like, here's like two million dollars. Like, yeah, jeez. My opinion is like, how the hell are you going to? How do you make that back? You just don't. Yeah. You, well, they raise a larger round. And then they raise a larger round. And the VCs invest in the first one, sell secondary to so the guy that's buying the third. <laughs> the guy in the third sells it to the fourth guy. It's like a scam. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But, you know, some of those companies end up being really big. You get a Stripe or a yeah. Facebook or whatever. Uber, yeah, so. 100%. What do you get by you guys? You guys doing angel investing? I mean, we, we've... I mean, we've considered investing in some of the brands that we take on at the agency, but like, it's, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's kind of like a shot in the dark, you know? I've, I've once thought to like invest in some of the brands that we work with through PL. It's like, at least I can make the money back if we're in through PL or something. Yeah. But then I was like, I looked at probably half these coming up, so like, they might not be around in a year. That's what I'm saying. You know what I mean? It's like kind of scary. Um, yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Dude. I'm always like right now I'm doing like a lot of real estate and stuff. Like, we bought our first property in December. I'm trying to buy another property right now. I'm trying to buy the warehouse we're in. So that's where I put my money. Just like uh, the, the way I saw real estate was like, for example, I bought a property for like 800 k pretty much. It's probably worth like 1.1 now. But I didn't even think of it like that. Like we put down like say 200000 buy it. Now, like my two hundred thousand is now worth like eight hundred grand. Like it's good. It's just it's just worth that because I'm paying my. You're buying I'm the buying, equity. I'm buying the equity every single month without even pulling money out of my pocket. You know what I mean? Dude, the refinances are crazy. Like and that. You refinance and all this shit. That too. that's where like that's where it's so genius. Where like it kind of clicked for me. Where I'm like shit maybe i do get into real estate because i like digital stuff i like not having a lot of risk liability yeah. but the refinance is crazy you know, i think there's less risk with real estate shit like all the crap that we do like, yeah actually, yeah it's like it's like it's like a it's like the oldest business model. I, I think it's even more it's less risky than like a, than a bank account because i like, think about it you have money in like uh i just opened up a marcus account because they give you like four percent marcus or whatever like it's like Goldman Sachs, a stupid bank account. Yeah, so I think I um, saw that. And like I'm scared to put money in. Like I'm, I'm actually scared to put money in because I'm like, well, Silicon Valley Bank went to yeah, shit. All these banks are going down. The other bank went to shit. Like I, like, I guess Marcus is with Goldman Sachs, but honestly, like Lehman Brothers went to shit. So like, 
who knows if Goldman Sachs, I'd rather just buy some bricks. The house can burn down. You know what I mean? Like if I make a few insurance. like. No, you have insurance. 100. To honestly, it's better you if have, it burns down. But you have yeah, that, you, 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 you have FDIC <laughs> bank insurance though, up to a quarter oh, million. No, no you do until funny. you don't. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> why not? Who knows? You know what I mean? Like you do until you don't. You know? Like actually, 250 thousand. I feel like it's just not. It's not a lot. Yeah. You need like if you have like a mill net worth, you need like actually, four yeah, bank the accounts. The fire probably is better than the fucking property itself. But that's besides the point. Yeah. No, but the refinance is crazy. Like, I, I'm probably He's about to go this. burn down his fucking warehouse tomorrow. No, well, no I'm, I'm, hey, what's I'm my gonna insurance policy? <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna butcher this, but like, let's say you put down two hundred on an eight hundred thousand property, and you refinance at a mill, you could pull the two hundred thousand out, and just literally put that in your pocket, and so now you're in the property with like technically nothing invested. Well, you, but the property has to be worth a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, to, like to, you to get like to the appraisal up. and yeah, then to yeah. be able to pull it out. Yeah, but like in a lot of instances, like that's just what happens. Like with real estate is just fucking fairy tale land where like you could buy a property and for some reason in six months, it's going to be worth 10% more than it is today. Like for what reason? <laughs> Even though everything inside is depreciating and like everyone depreciates the assets to save money on taxes. It's all like counterintuitive, but that's where the rich are at. So you got to do. Yeah. You doing real estate or no? Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. I will though, hundred percent. Do you do you pay for rent? I think rent's the biggest scam in the world too. Um, I can't pay rent. Well, you got HOA fees. You got insurance. You got a tax. Uh, fuck, Property interest taxes. on your mortgage, and like all that is just that goes out the window. So like, if you don't want to put a large sum of money down and you want to be flexible where you're living, you just rent. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah, you can also just write off a lot of the, the rent, like a third of it or something. Whatever. The, oh, yeah. whatever the square footage is of the workspace. Well, that's, what's the what's the workspace then, what's boys? The, <laughs> I think that's I think you that's know? changed recently because I'd argue that I work in every square inch of my apartment, but my accountant's like even thirty percent is pushing it, and even thirty percent. His accountant sucks. He's my old accountant. He sucks. <laughs> I fired him. And but, Nick, if you're watching this, sorry. I love no, you. But, but even the thirty percent that you write off, like I, whenever I think about tax deductions, I think of oh, I'm just getting that for like thirty percent off, or whatever your tax bracket is. If it's forty percent. You're like, oh, I'm getting that for 40% off. Because if you make like 200, 200K, you buy a $50,000 car, people are like, oh, I don't have to pay 50K in taxes. I got a free car or something. But it's like, no, like you you offset your income. Yeah. So, so now, it's, now it's 150K. That's when no, everyone's like, oh. That's... Yeah. And so like, but, see, but like you do get like a discount on whatever the thing you're buying on whatever your kind of well, tax yeah, bracket it, it, is. I guess but... you'd say like 20K pretty much. What's up, New Money Talks fam? We just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Scale Brands. This is a self plug because this is my direct consumer marketing agency uh, where we help D2C brands grow through paid advertising and brand growth consulting. And I can confidently say that we are among the best at what we do because I've actually built my own brands to upwards of $1.7 million a month. I've built multiple brands to multi six figures per month as well. Very, very profitably, might I add. And we are specialists at helping brands grow. So if you are an e-commerce brand and you are looking to streamline your ad creative acquisition, uh, you're looking to grow your paid acquisitions uh, channels, and you're looking to be able to implement systems and frameworks that are backed by over eight figures in profitable ad spend and close to nine figures in attributed direct consumer e-commerce revenue, then Scale Brands is the agency for you. So again, if you run an e-commerce brand or you know someone who runs a direct consumer e-commerce brand, send them over to scalebrands.com and make sure that you tell them that New Money Talks sent you so you can get that New Money Talks discount. Now back to the podcast. You yeah, exactly. You'd, you'd save like 20K on buying the car, but like you still bought the cars. Like you still yeah. paid 30K for a car that you thought like, you know, that, that you probably didn't need, but that you were like, oh, I'm saving money on taxes. A lot of people think about that. Like the end of the year, they're like, like even my business partner, he was like, it's like, yo, like, should we like buy some iPads or like MacBooks? I was like, do you need one? Like, do you like, do you really need one? Or like, it's like, no, I'm like then no. Like, because you're really just getting a discount on it. It's not like, oh, we owe, you know, 50K in taxes. Like, you just buy 50K worth of stuff and now you owe nothing. Like, that's not how, it sounds like it's how it works, but like, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. I don't think that's a very good uh, strategy. What strategy? Just buying iPads at the end of the year. <laughs> I'm sure you guys did that. <laughs> no, dude. Like you're just buying containers of Dude, uh, tell me about the, tell them about the car thing, because car that, thing? that's such a hack. What car thing? How, so if you buy a car... Um, what is it, section 179? Yeah, oh, the, the weight, yeah, yeah, G Wagon, the rolls. But you could finance it though. This is the crazy part. So if you finance it, you could pull like whatever, three, five K down, finance it, pay like eight. Not more than that. Say whatever, like 25. Whatever you put down, it doesn't matter. 
But you can write off the whole amount. In the first year. In the first yeah, year. It's fucking sick. It's kind of crazy. But the problem is like, not even fucking G-Wagon you have to deal with. You know what I mean? And it's when you account. sell it, you have to pay capital gains on the, the whole value of the car instead of just the difference of whatever you bought it for and sold it for. So I'll give you another hack I'm thinking through. So rather than buying G-Wagons, you buy trucks. And then you start a little freight company. You start running ads on the trucks. Oh, with our oh, friend Joe. Double Joe. dip. Shout out Joe. Shout out Joe. It's like a double dip right there. Actually, that could probably work because like Joe probably pays like a thousand or two thousand a month if like you have a truck with him, and like a, a payment on a truck is like eight hundred bucks a month. Yeah, I wonder about that. I like trucks a lot. Yeah, trucks are good. I'll tell yeah. you the problem with trucks though. The maintenance is a, is a bitch on trucks. So like for example, how do you know that? I know that. So like our last warehouse was a trucking facility. Uh, okay. And the guy had like sixty trucks. And then he had a team of like 10 people just fixing the trucks every single day. That's number one. Then Joe, like my partner with Chip Dudes, his dad owns like a food distribution company. They have maybe like a hundred trucks, but they don't own any of them on purpose. They lease every single one of them because the second one goes down, the leasing company brings them a brand new one. Yeah, but dude, like the leasing company is making money on those trucks. You, the cost for the repairing of the trucks is baked in to what Joe's dad is already paying for the trucks, bro. It is, but it's also very costly. It's no, it's you. You don't. You don't, you don't think so? I, I think that's the wrong way to think of it. Think about it. It wouldn't make economic sense for the leasing company if it like if they yeah, couldn't. The, yeah, afford, the leasing company they would not exist if they didn't yeah, yeah. factor in the maintenance. But but, 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 but Joe, but Joe's dad company. gets peace of mind of not having to repair it himself or worry about any of that. So like that's what he's paying maybe a premium for. He's got to turn a cost center into a profit center. He's got to yeah. buy the trucks. Talk to our other buddy Joe. Have that Joe put some fucking brands on there. Then Joe's dad is making money on the trucks. The problem is he's driving him in the city at like 8 a.m. Yeah, that was the problem. It's so not I prime connected time. the two of them <laughs> and they love talking to each other. But all the deliveries are in the morning and Joe needs it like at like two prime. o'clock. You know what I mean? Like p.m. Yeah. So Dude, it's just slots. It's an inventory slot. It's an inventory problem. You, you know? know, well, what I'm saying is like, all right, you know, the 8 a.m. slots, you know, a third of the price. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's more inventory. Did he tell you about the L- Lamelo Ball one that he did? No. So we did a deal with Lamelo Ball. <laughs> like Lamelo Ball has like a drink brand called like Drinks or something. Oh yeah. I've uh, seen that. And he got a truck. This is kind of crazy. He literally got a truck to pass by Lamelo's penthouse, like his apartment, like his apartment that's in front of the stadium, right after the basketball game. Like he just scheduled that somehow. So he found like a route that literally does that every single day. But when the game ends, like Lamelo could literally see the truck from his fucking apartment. <laughs> And he closed a deal with him. And he closed a deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, I think he has a running right now with him. It's fucking awesome. Shout out, Joe. So that is something that Joe would do. Yeah. Oh, one hundred. And he was only he was only operating in New Jersey, and like he like find he gets the connection, and he's like, yeah, can you? Uh, wh- where does he live? Uh, Lamelo. He's oh, in like Charlotte, Charlotte. right? Charlotte, yeah. He's yeah. like, I'm in Charlotte. You got any trucks in Charlotte? He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, of course. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Of course. What kind of operation do you think I'm running? He, he hangs up, just calls like every trucking company. He's like, we're going to make this work. We're going to figure it out. That's that's all the best entrepreneurs, though. Well, that's so like got, Steve with the fucking T. Yeah. That's what you got to do. You just for, go figure it out. Oh, why yeah, why yeah, T? Yeah. Why not like a physical product that's like, I mean, it's a physical product. Why not product? just be a banker? Why not a non consumable like banker? Yeah, kill banking. <laughs> but like good, good quests. Yeah. Good quests. Good okay. quests. Yeah. Uh, no, Matra, just the timing made a lot of sense. Um, like how'd you even know about the timing if like it didn't exist? Oh, dude, I looked on Google Trends. <laughs> Did you really? I went on explodingtopics.com. There's, there's no <laughs> way. <laughs> no, no, Google Trends was like this. And then really? I was like, oh. Like, this was six years ago. Yeah, yeah, like 2017. And um, Google Trends like this. Yeah. Like, and then um, another thing was like, there's this concept in life called the Lindy effect. The what? Lindy. What does that mean? It means <laughs> that how long something has been around is an indication of how likely it will be around in the future. Okay. Matra has been around for like a thousand years. It is like a staple in Japanese culture. Not only is it um, drank as tea, but it's in a lot of other things. It's in ice cream. It's in cakes. It's in cookies. It's not. It's it's a flavor, um, almost more than anything. Like you can get matcha beers. They make it in cocktails. Um, so there's a lot of applications. 
The Lindy, Lindy effect? Lindy effect. By this uh, philosopher in Nassim Taleb. He wrote a really good book called Anti-Fragile. Do you like philosophy? Yeah, I dabble. But I'm not like a, you know, philosophy fucking expert. I love, he's like, you're like soft-spoken, very philosophical, but like you got a lot of just like. I can hold my own. I know. It's kind of crazy. Like I, I want to keep asking you questions. I know shit's just like fucking in there. Nah, yeah. I want to pull it out. Yeah. You read books? Yeah. You do? Oh, yeah, dude. Really? Do I read books? I don't read shit. Why, why are you surprised at that? <laughs> dude, what's the last book you read? I'm reading one right now. For like the laws of power. You've been reading that book for like two For like years. two months. Yeah. Now, before that, I think I, I yeah, read You actually read a lot of books. Yeah. Like, dude, how do you have time I, to read I've books? I've been trying to get like one a month. Every single night before I go to bed, I read. It's like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah, sometimes okay. during the day, I don't eat lunch. Now I'm, now I'm kind of like into podcasts, but... Um, Especially like when I was just starting with Tenzo, like learning is so important. It compounds over years. Like, so yeah, I just read a ton, dude. A ton of books. Our whole apartment, my apartment's like overrun with books, dude. Got fucking books everywhere. Have you applied like anything specifically tangible from that into the, your businesses? Or? Um, probably a lot of it actually. It's like unconsciously, even. Yeah, unconsciously. It's like built into the fabric of who I am. Yeah. I have a question about employees and shit. How do you, did you do more training or did the employees come with like skills and like you kind of just like put them in the right place? Um, the last couple of employees we've hired all came with skills in place. Does that make a big difference? He, a monumental difference. So like they're teaching you shit. Yeah. And they're just very good at what they do. Before them, though, was it a lot of just like... Yeah, when we first started, we hired our fucking friends and fucking bullshit. Yeah. It was a college guy, I don't know, dude. They all sucked. No offense. Love all you guys. We would not be here without you. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever fear that, like, you take someone on that's, like, very qualified and there comes a time where they kind of, like, stiff arm you? They're like, listen, if you don't double my salary, I'm, like, clocking out of here. Yeah, you fire them. You've dealt with that. Even if it's like a very well, like. Yeah, we had this role. one expensive contractor and paying her 15K a month. And I was like, damn, wow. what the fuck? She was not pulling her weight. Yeah. No offense uh, if you hear this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, she wasn't. We fired her. Simple. Simple as that. Not bad. Where do we want to take this? We're almost done with this, right? Yeah, 53 minutes. I'm tired pretty, pretty solid. Shout, solid. shout out the agency. Where can they find you with this agency? Um, it's called Spotlight, tryspotlight.co, or you can just DM me on Twitter, Instagram, wherever. What's your, what's your Instagram? So delicious. No way. My Instagram, yeah. <laughs> like spelled the normal way. So There's an extra delicious. L, because my last name's Odell. Ah. It's like S Odell, and it's S O delicious. Ah. And then what's your Twitter? <laughs> uh, Sodell244. Or Twitter or Instagram. We want people to hit you up. Either one's fine. I don't, we'll I don't care. Yeah. We'll put I, up both. I had a question about um about just college athletics in general. Because we talked to a lot of entrepreneurs that like when we crack into what they did when they were young, they always did like something competitively, whether it's like karate or like football or whatever. Do you think that shaped any like your perspective on entrepreneurship and just like. Yeah. Any, I mean, most important thing I learned how to do is like work really hard. Be, be like obsessed. I have like an extremely addictive personality. Um, so yeah, really, really hard work. And I was never like the most skilled. I can't like jump 40 inches or like, I'm not like going to ask what your vertical is. Like, it's my, high. You know, I, I, you my, know. my whole like ath athletic career has just been revolved around vertical jump. Cause I was like basketball shortest kid playing. I didn't even love basketball, but like, I like the concept of me at like five, eight being able to dunk and like the six, two kids, like barely grazing rim yeah. from just like outworking them. It's so fun. important. It takes so much time to, to like a lot of these things, you know, volleyball, vertical jump, basketball, it takes so much time. Like people, people don't get it. Like they're asking me like, oh, like what workouts did you do? I'm like, dude, I've been doing this for 10 years. Like Bro, since I was. workouts I've done, you have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> like since I was 13, all I want to do is dunk a basketball and I'm, you know, 24 now. And like, I maybe put on like I don't know, 10, 20 inches or something like that from like 20 to 30 inches or 25 yep. to 35. Can you dunk? You can dunk, right? Dude, I don't know about right now. I'm not, uh, <laughs> this phase of my life is not into working out. 
<laughs> oh no, you don't do the cold the cold plunges and the uh, working out. No, I don't. I think cold What's plunges are so routine? dumb. I'm like cold plunges. Just go take a cold shower. Like that's not the same, dude. Cold, cold plung- shower. Cold showers are easy. Cold plunges are hard. That's the difference, dude. So I do not know how hard they are. Like every day after a practice or a gym at UCLA, we would just go in the cold plunge. Like, it's just like it's good for your muscle recovery. Yeah, but like just to do it, like because it's hard. I think like oh, well, like why don't you go? Well, like, you do that be after a good dad. You, you do or, that like. Fucking, what? I just think like it, for like a, a fucking everyone talks about cold plunge. I'm just saying like, but like they they cold plunge, but like they're behind at work or like they they're not a good father. Yeah, like, they had all this other fucked up shit. Like, dude, like just go face the actual problems that are right in front of your life. Yeah, like, let me, don't let me, tell me about it. Let me. Ask I don't you care. Though, a majority of your your cold plunges were like post workout. Like that's what you're taught. It's yeah, yeah. Collegiately too. Like that's easy because you've just like you've burned all these calories. You're exhausted. Like it's like refreshing. But like if you wake up at like six in the morning and you jump in that thing and it's dark outside, that shit sucks. Well, like that's that's dude, more of a mental priming you know, thing for the day. Conversely, conversely, your brain is actually at its best operating state in the morning. So it's the easiest to do the hardest things in the morning. That's why you always start your day with the hardest projects. I don't believe that. Yeah, dude. Look at look at why, it up. why look does everyone sleep through their alarm clock if it's so easy to do everything first they, thing in the morning? They don't sleep enough or they're on their phones or they're fucking getting drunk. But the the thing is, why don't you cold plunge at nine PM and night, ten PM? Then then I'll be like, All right, I got a little respect for Kyle. Because that's, like, that's what I'm like. That's what I'm like reading, winding down. He's about <laughs> to go do one. <laughs> night. He's about you, to dude. get home and do one. No, no, but no, I th- no, I just I don't buy. It. I, I actually just, no, no. I think I think what you we were you were saying before with like your most productive hours. It's actually not right when you wake up. It's like after an hour you wake up. There's like a three hour window. But it's yeah, not like yeah, right yeah, when you yeah wake up. something like that. So but, like if I so if I wake up and jump in a cold plunge, that takes five minutes. And but I you know what I usually go to the gym right after. Like I, I go to the gym before I work because I just find that like if I work. I'm never getting to the gym because I'm going to work till fucking seven. Yeah, eight, you, know? you know, dude, I don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not against cold plunging at all. Like, I just think it's like now be, it's like become this thing. Like a trend. Like, it's like people who are vegan, you know, they're always like, I'm vegan. Yeah. yeah. You know, tell like, everyone. it's just like that. That's how it, cold plunging is the same way. You cold plunge. You yeah. know, we're talking about it. Like, it's <laughs> yeah. like it's, it always comes up. That's a good dropshipping product, though. Cold plunge right now. Yeah, yeah no, it is. Like high high and, OV, a lot of demand, yeah. like are you guys doing I, I think no no i think not. i think the important thing is like if if you are gonna partake in something hard like like for example 75 hard like a lot of people do that put yep. it on social media like if you're gonna partake in something difficult like you have to um like uh atomic habits if you've read atomic habits it's kind of like Great habit book. stacking totally. so a lot a lot of people will do one, they'll change one thing about their schedule and think it cha- it's going to change everything but you need to like stack habits so if your first if your first thing is like oh i want to wake up earlier then like, okay, that's great. But if you wake up earlier and then like you still do shit work and you don't get anything done, then you have to figure out how to have a more productive like work schedule and like kind of stack the two things or stack multiple things. So that's where, that's where like the, you know, the cold plunge in the first, first thing in the morning, it's like, I wake up, I do something hard. And then right after I'm like, I'm not going to fucking go back to bed. Like I'm going to the gym. I feel fired up. I'm ready to go. So it's, it's more of a stacking thing than like that thing by itself. But a lot of people think it's just that by itself. They wake up, they do it, they film it, and like they feel accomplished, and they do nothing the rest of the day. Like that's yeah. not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> my uh, my habit stack in the morning is making my bed. Oh, you do? I haven't made do you my not? Bed. Oh, hell no, dude. <laughs> Serial killer over here, <laughs> dude. You gotta make your bed, bro. Dude, I don't make you're, my bed. How do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> she does it for me. Like, <laughs> bro. Today was Donut Wednesday, actually. So at the warehouse, we had a lot of donuts. Today. It's like my morning. Show up at like nine twenty. <laughs> You just don't roll in. Me and Joe yell at each other a little bit. Shut the fuck up, Joe. Pretty much. That's literally <laughs> it. And they'll be like, Jake, what the hell are you doing? This type of thing. And yeah, like I don't stack no habit. It's just like every day. Yeah. Just, just do it. You know what I mean? Just work. Yeah. yeah I, I think to each throw. You, really be- you make your bet every day? Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, I just think like my even bigger meta point is like no one cares and like just do the right thing. Do what you got to like, do. Yeah. Like, I really don't care that you don't make your bed. No, yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you care <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> so bad, funny. I used to have this basketball coach in high school, Coach Jay, shout out as a homie. We were losing a game by a lot, like 20 points. And he turns to us and goes, y'all better take care of y'all business. And honestly, I just like, it's in my head all day. I'm just like, just got to take care of I don't care how I do it. I, I start at 10 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Up until midnight, just take care of my business. That's like literally like my motto to my life. Just like take care of my business. And I know what my business is. Take care of it. Some shit's important to me. Some shit's not important to me. 
I just take care of my business. Yeah, I think exactly. most of us are like that. We just like do it in our own special way. You know what I mean? So whether you do your bed, you don't do your bed, you do your plunge, you don't do your plunge. Yeah. You probably drink matcha seven times a day. Yeah, no, to each their own. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Before we end this, stupid question, but important question. How do you make the matcha like taste like sweet and shit? Do you put like sugar in this thing? Because like I started, after you sent me a box, I started drinking it and I was like, it just tastes like green tea. Um, like, what yeah, do people I mean, put in this thing? There's a million ways to make it. Um, but like the basis of it is a matcha shot. It's very similar to an espresso shot. Okay. Like you just, you blend that with whatever you want. So you can pour that over water and ice. Oh, I had it with water. Like I was drinking it with water and I was like, it just tastes like green tea. Yeah, yeah. Mix it with honey. With honey. Honey's fire. Like honey, oat milk, mint. Mint. You don't have any uh, mushrooms integrated into it, right? No. <laughs> and that, that's, no. The, <laughs> that's the big trend right now. Putting like, you know, mushroom coffee, mushroom matcha, all it's this huge. stuff. It's huge. Are you yeah. doing stuff like that? Or you guys don't even give a shit about that. Uh, no, we're not doing anything with it. Could care less. Do you think that's a, like it's a decent market for people to get into? Because it's kind of on the uptrend like matcha was. Um, no, I think mushrooms is oversaturated. And we are going to see a lot of the trendy companies that everyone thinks are cool. Go out of business. Yeah. Especially like the, all the like fucking there's like 10 mushroom subscription companies that are all doing yeah. like 10 to 50 million a year. They're all stuck yeah. there. Yeah, there's there's no way like, you're not getting out, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, someone's done. Yeah, like, yeah, a couple yeah. of them. Not maybe one will get out, but Forcing Matic, the earliest one, is by far the biggest mushroom company in the country. Forcing Matic. I don't think it's even close. They're so the bigger, only, bigger than Mudwater. Oh yeah, they're the only one that nailed that's gotten retail figured out. Interesting. And there's an even bigger one, Ohm Mushrooms, O M, or they're like same size as Forcing Matic. They're like 30 years old, dude. Oh, they sell shit. them like. Costco and like GNC or like random like big retailers like the D to C companies. They're all screwed. Yeah, it's just it's totally different. Like, I just think there's a million ways to grow companies, right? So, cool. I got one final question for you. So, for those who are listening, um, let's say let's say those who are listening who are like between like twenty twenty five, a little bit younger than you. What would you, if you could go back in time, what would you tell your twenty one year old self? Um, you're on the right track. I think like a lot of things I did, like were actually very worthwhile. Like I always started, I was never delaying. Like I had extreme urgency around like, like life and like getting shit done and like one, like being successful. Um, but yeah, I just think you need to actively do things a lot. That's a good way Um, to end this. Yeah. Yeah. Do. Make sure you subscribe. Actively subscribe. Yeah, actively subscribe, subscribe to the channel. Actually, we need to get to fifteen hundred subs. We go fifteen hundred. Not bad. Fifteen hundred. Oh, yeah. we're, we're cranking it up. Let's Just cross a thousand. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope we cross a thousand on this episode. Yeah. Oh man, hit up Steve. Like like legit though. Like uh, honestly, you might cap out of points. You might not even be able to talk to the guy, but. Yeah. If, if you, <laughs> John you know snuck I mean? in somehow. What happened? <laughs> you snuck in. Yeah, I snuck in. You know what you're going to do. It's, it's part of the process. We're I didn't know to... what to do. I thought I was just like, dude, this guy's fucking drop shipper, bro. I, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust him. <laughs> oh, man. But hey. Now we're becoming boys, dude. Now we're boys. Yeah. Now we're boys. Sounds good. But uh, Kyle, do the gentleman's agreement. Tell them what that is before. So the saying goes. We provide all this value to everyone who's listening completely for free. All we ask in exchange is just show some engagement, a like, a comment, share with a friend who uh, who's addicted to matcha and have him switch to a better brand. Can we get a promo code for this thing too? Like a new money talks 15 or something. Yeah. New money talks 15 done free uh, 15% off every order lifetime. Let's do Ooh. it. Wait, so are we doing new money talks or NMT? Because NMT is a shorter NMT little back half. Yeah, NMT 15. NMT 15. Let's do it. All right. Thank you, bro. Appreciate yeah, you. Time. Yeah, thank Anytime, you for coming boys. on. Thank Thanks you for watching. Uh, see, see you on the next, next one. one.